Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first of the Sea Turtle Rescue Alliance's uh, sea talk uh, on the series of Sea Turtle Medical Series. So before we start, um, I'd like to introduce you all, before I start introducing you to Dr. Max Poliak, I'm just going to introduce you again to the Sea Turtle Rescue Alliance if you have yet to hear about it and what we hope to achieve. So the Sea Turtle Rescue Alliance's mission uh, is to connect and empower the Sea Turtle Rescue and Rehabilitation Community uh, with tools to improve the care and welfare of injured sea turtles around the world. Now, the Sea Turtle Rescue Alliance's goals is to promote professional collaboration uh, to, by sharing best practices and clinical knowledge, as well as data to enhance medical application at facilities worldwide and to support the global conservation for all species of sea turtle. Um, I'm Dr. Claire Petros. Um, I'm also a sea turtle veterinarian and I work for the lead uh, as the lead veterinarian for the Olive Ridley Project. Um, and I'm helping to set up um, the Sea Turtle Rescue Rescue Alliance with uh, also Dr. Max Poliak, so um, as well as the rest of the team. So before um, I kind of start the talk off, I'd just like to tell you the present and future plans for the Alliance. Uh, we are currently in the process of building um, an online resource with Microsoft Teams by collating guidelines of common procedures, um, including video tutorials um, and having regional committees, as well as um, having access to uh, Provet Cloud. Now, Provet Cloud, we're exceptionally grateful to as they are a patient management software and we're helping to develop it to be specifically for sea turtles. And this will mean that any rescue center that requires patient management software will be able to have access to this if they become a member of the Sea Turtle Rescue Alliance. So moving forward, we're hoping to have more regular meetings and we're hoping to do um, bi-monthly series of um, talks like similar to this one that we're about to hear. Um, and also we'll be introducing to you any member um, affiliated partner, so any rescue center that joins STRA so that you'll have a better idea of where sea turtle rescue centers are in the world and to make you feel that you're connected with them. So um, we are basically looking now to have new members um, and we're hoping that anyone that would like to join us will also want to be a content creator. So any guidelines that you may have for your particular species that you treat, we're looking to get involved with putting on our platform, online platform as a library. Uh, we're also looking for peer reviewers for practice guidelines and translators, of course. We want this to be a worldwide global uh, alliance and therefore we'd like to have all of the guidelines available in multiple languages. And we're also looking for interesting social media content that we can share on our channels. We currently have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and also our YouTube channels too. So, and LinkedIn actually for more professional uh, side of things. So if you have any interesting clinical cases that you'd like us to share, please feel free to get in touch. And anyone that has any specialty, particular in sea turtle medicine, please do get in touch to be a guest speaker um, moving forward. So we're hoping that we'll have lots of interesting interactive talks just like this over multiple time zones. So if you're currently asleep and waiting for the weekend to watch this, um, it will hopefully be there um, available soon. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Max Poliak. So Max, Dr. Max completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Southern California, graduate studies at the University of Cambridge and veterinary school at the University of Florida. He has practiced and taught marine animal conservation and medicine on three continents. Dr. Max is Director of Rehabilitation and Attending Veterinarian at the Loggerhead Marine Life Center in Juneau Beach, Florida, where he directs innovations in clinical therapeutics, research efforts, veterinary training, and global sea turtle medicine capacity building at one of the largest and busiest hospitals in the world dedicated to treatment, care, and research of endangered and threatened sea turtle species. In his free time, he enjoys surfing and yoga. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Dr. Max. And we'll hopefully hear a very, very interesting talk for the first of the series. Hi, can, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, and can you see the screen, everyone? Just it's loading now, I think. Yep, yeah, there we go. I'll let you go. Well, thanks so much, Claire. I appreciate uh, the introduction. And thank you, everyone who um, is tuning in today. It's, a, it's an exciting day for the Alliance. Um, and I'm very grateful to be a steering committee member um, of, this, of this terrific initiative. Um, it, I think it has a lot of potential. And it is going to be um, something that we can all look forward to um, as, as, as folks who enjoy and work within the sea turtle rescue, uh, rehab and research communities. So I will get started. I'm, I'm coming to you from live from uh, Juno Beach, beautiful Juno Beach, Florida. Uh, it's a little cloudy today, but um, 
we can't complain here weather-wise. Well, I wanted to kind of give you just a little bit about me and who I am and, and how I got to uh, where I am today. Um, I'm from coastal uh, Southern California. I went to college out there and at USC uh, and had the opportunity to go to graduate school in England, uh, which was great. And I was on my way to human medical school from there at Cornell Medical School, in, in, which is located in New York. Um, and during the time when I was preparing for that, uh, just about to start actually, I was involved with uh, research in the organ transplant surgery department at Cornell. And um, I ended up uh, developing with some colleagues um, a device to improve the function of organs uh, for transplant. So I never really wanted to be a medical doctor. Uh, <laughs> I don't really like um, uh, sick people, to be honest. So what I did was um, I ended up uh, giving my seat up to someone who really wanted to be a physician. And uh, I went uh, and developed or built a company around this technology. That went, that went well and I ended up selling it. And then I had the time and, and the resources to kind of do what I've always wanted to do. So I went to vet school a little bit later in life, which kind of is, can show you that there are all kinds of ways to get to where you need to be um, in this world. And so I chose University of Florida primarily for their, um, their reputation in aquatic animal medicine training. And so I went there, got my vet degree, um, was involved and still uh, am involved in the, um, in the College of Medicine at the University of Florida uh, as, an ad, as a courtesy uh, faculty and um, was involved in uh, as a trustee at the University of Florida's Sea Turtle Hospital uh, at its very founding. Now it's it's really busy place uh, that specializes in fibropapillomatosis. They do great work up there. Um, spent many, many years um, teaching um, marine conservation and, and marine animal medicine uh, overseas in a couple of places listed there. And then I found my way down to Juneau Beach, where I'm now a director of rehabilitation and one of the attending veterinarians. And I'm also, as mentioned, um, one of the uh, uh, steering committee members of this terrific alliance that's hosting this talk today. So what do I do? Um, well, we function here as a sea turtle university. So all we see are sea turtles and we treat them with the intent to release them back home to the wild. We have an advanced teaching hospital. We're very, very lucky and grateful to have that. So we have kind of the diagnostic armamentarium available to us that you would see in a university teaching hospital for veterinary medicine or even for human medicine for that matter. So our mantra here is that we, we treat, we teach and we innovate. And that kind of drives everything we do here on a daily basis. And that includes things like pushing the envelope in clinical therapies, really kind of not just thinking outside the box, but really living outside the box. Because these species, as you know, hold such an amazing biological niche that everything we learn in vet school or many of the things we learn in our veterinary training don't apply exactly to the treatment of these species. So we have to innovate all of the time. Teaching is an important part of our mission. And so I have um, visiting veterinary students in their fourth year rotate through here as part of their curriculum. So in that sense, we also function as a university level facility. Um, and these are kind of some of the pictures here of what um, this top picture I'm pointing out here is our outdoor uh, turtle hospital, which has now been demolished because we're in the middle, we're in towards the end of a huge expansion, which is really exciting. This here is a turtle getting a transfusion. This is some teaching overseas in Thailand. These are mostly veterinary students and, and veterinarians. This is just an ultrasound of a female green sea turtle looking here at the follicles you can see up there. Um, this is a uh, colonoscopy of an adult male uh, loggerhead and you can see what that looks like there and it's a surgery just kind of some routine things of something that should not be in the GI tract of a sea turtle which is that hook and this is a hyperbaric uh, chamber. So what we uh, do here uh, at a, in a strategic way and kind of almost a philosophical way is that we practice conservation medicine and we do it in a, in, in a kind of a different uh, with a different uh, trajectory uh, as opposed to the conventional conservation medicine that you might think of, which is, you know, the, the captive breeding and the reintroduction of species back into the wild. What we do here is we treat endangered and threatened sea turtles so that they can 
and, and we return them back to the wild so that they can continue adding to their, their populations on their own. So it's a really special and really um, important uh, mission that we, we uh, are lucky enough to, to do here and, um, and, and, and share with, with colleagues around the world. So this is kind of, um, we have a, a robust research department here as well. And they are primarily um, interested in population health and kind of like epidemiology of sea turtles almost. So they do amazing things and they're biologists. So we always kind of have this joke here uh, um, about sea turtle vets and sea turtle biologists. And then if you look at this picture, and I always show this, to, and you can, it's pretty obvious which, which people are the medical people and which people are the biologists, but this is that adult male um, loggerhead. And this is Dr. Justin Perot, who's a, our director of research, a terrific guy, an amazing researcher. Um, and this is Dr. Charlie Muneer, who is uh, our chief and one of the godfathers of sea turtle medicine. He's the chief editor of, of the first and only textbook um, of these species in existence. And this is Sam Clark, one of our clinical managers. And this is the inside of the gut of this large animal. Okay, so I wanna walk you through a few of the things that we see here in some specific cases that I think you might find interesting and that are, um, that are not unique to our waters, but that we see here very often. And these are kind of the usual suspects that we see. Vessel strikes, chronic debilitation is a, is a significant um, contributor to our patient census, entanglements, predation, and buoyancy syndrome, um, for those of you that don't know, is, uh, is simply the inappropriate uh, floating at the surface of the ocean of, of, of a sea turtle, and it's caused by a variety of, uh, of different things, um, hence the name syndrome. We get some toxicoses and uh, fibropapillomatosis, FP, is still very prevalent in our waters. Um, as well. But I'm going to focus on just a handful of these and kind of show you our approach here to um, treating some of these uh, quite devastating presentations. Our first patient here that I want to walk you through is little Cecil. So Cecil came um, uh, last year and uh, presented as a chronic debilitated patient. And if you haven't seen what that looks like, this is a juvenile grain sea turtle. This is what it looks like. So they're uh, in various stages of starvation, uh, can be mild, moderate, or profound emaciation, very, very near death. Um, the, the hallmark clinical features are severe anemia, hypoglycemia, and a very, very thin turtle. This is a radiograph of a very skinny animal. Um, and uh, this particular condition is, and, and tissue is sloughing off too. It's, that's towards the advanced stages of this, of this disease. And, and Cecil um, had that in fact, um, in, a, in a pretty profound way. But the chronic debilitation is a, is a kind of con condition that the causes of which we, we're not exactly sure, we're speculating, we have a good idea what, what may be causing this, but it's a type of disease that when we see it, we know what it is and we know how to treat it. So Cecil uh, had a, the front right flipper look like this on presentation. So this is a, you know, an exposed uh, radius and ulna here of, of the elbow, elbow joint of, of this little guy. And, and you see that's pretty, that's pretty uh, devastating, you know, and, and would likely warrant uh, amputation. I mean, an, an amputation is, an, is a perfectly reasonable um, course to take from a clinical perspective. Um, we, we, we tried, we wanted to try something different here. And he, he was kind of at the beginning of a series of patients that we tried this new approach with, which is the medical management of complicated um, cases like this. And so uh, what did we do? How did we approach that? Well, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort um, to begin to address this type of wound. So in addition to treating the animal systemically and treating the other underlying uh, features of chronic debilitation. Uh, we're also treating that wound. And we use a lot of integrative medicine here, uh, principles of integrative medicine, like acupuncture and aquapuncture, which is what Cecil is getting here. Um, we use uh, cold laser therapy. We use topicals that include more conventional medicines and, and antimicrobial potentiators as well as more ancient medicines like medicinal honey. So kind of all of these things combined 
We also have available to us hyperbaria, um, which is a, an important um, component moving forward for us here as we expand to be able to treat uh, tissue, soft tissue wounds in particular, in addition to other things. So this is what happened um, after a lot of work with Cecil. And so um, you can see the, the wound is, is largely um, repaired and uh, uh, full function was not um, re um, returned to the limb, but about 85 to 90% of it was. And, and in the wild, um, it, may, it may even improve upon that percentage. Um, so this was a pretty uh, uh, great um, illustration of what can be done on the medical side of things. A lot of things have to kind of come together to, to pull this off. And so it, uh, I'm not suggesting that this is something that can happen with every sea turtle that you encounter that has a, a either debilitation or an entanglement or something to one of its um, appendicular joints. But the, the option and the clinical availability of medical management is certainly there. And it's certainly something that I think ought to be considered to increase um, the animal's success in the wild upon release is really the goal and, and to have all four or portions of even all four limbs intact is kind of the the clinical uh, approach that we we take here and um we've had we've had decent success at it so i'm hope i'm glad to be able to share some of these with you this is margaret ingles and this turtle you can see as a subadult loggerhead that was um, entangled all four limbs were involved and the back right was particularly uh, uh um injured uh, this this uh, monofilament fishing line wrapped around her neck and and trailed down into her esophagus. So this this patient we also treated um, with a medical management approach to this limb injury. This uh, this top right picture is one of the debridements um, that occurred and and these larger animals in particular when they're circumferential uh, damage all the way down to the bone. Um, in circumferentially about 80%, even up to 90%. Again, it's it's a perfectly reasonable approach to to want to amputate and, and to do so. It's it's a quick procedure. The animal can be released in a relatively short period of time post-operatively. Um, but but the medical side of approaching this is also available, with the caveat that it takes it takes more time and 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 uh, and, uh, and human resource and 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 in some ways financial resources. Um, um, are included in that in that whole sequela of things. So uh, that's also there, but uh, it is available. And so in, in this case, uh, Margaret Ingalls was released um, with all four limbs intact. So we're really happy about that. Um, and she was, was a patient just this past year as well. All of these patients are fairly recent. So I wanted to try to include animals that we've seen here just in the, in the last several months. This is Gumby. So this is another type of um, presentation we see here a lot. And this is one of the, one of the kind of categories of, of buoyancy disorder, buoyancy syndrome. So Gumby was struck by presumed propellers um, on his carapace and he has partially healed carapacial wounds that you can see kind of through the water here. Um, I've got some radiographs to show you uh, what that looks like in a different in a different uh, way, but um, he was struck up here, up in the middle, and then down here, and in the the second and and more caudal uh, injured areas, uh, his spine was involved, um, and so this animal was was paralyzed in his hind limbs. That's a very very common feature of of animals that that present here on emergency with buoyancy disorder. One of the complications of, of trauma like that is um, the, the uh, disruption of the function of the gastrointestinal tract. And, and we see this here too. You see profound gas um, in the GI segments here of, of Gumby. Um, and you see some you know, cirrhosal detail that's, that's pathologic. And, and, and this is what is causing the animal to float. And it's related to uh, the injury he sustained in the wild. So the, the spine is damaged, um, the enteric nervous system is involved and an ileus uh, uh, in varying degrees sets in. So it can be a really challenging thing to, to treat and it's multifactorial. 
Um, you know, you treat the gas, and if it's compressive to the point where the animal can't ventilate, you can you can um, use different approaches of of, of synthesis. So enterocentesis, colonocentesis, things like that. In a smaller animal, you have uh, those options available to you via the prefemoral space, but um, but uh, in a larger animal, it's more challenging. So what I'm going to do here is show you a CT of what that damage looked like. So that's what he was faced with. And you can see it kind of going all the way through, um, not completely severing his spine, but, but, but a good amount of it there is, is taken off. And this is just the other view of it. Um, and so this helps us kind of inform our, our clinical management of these patients, the CT does. and. Um, and in his case, he actually um, did quite well. He was transferred to a different facility and subsequently released. Um, but he uh, he is, and this is right before he was released or transferred rep. And this is pretty much where we need him to be before we can medically clear him, provided everything else is going okay. So this is him in the tank and you can see he is paralyzed in the back. He doesn't have use of those hind flippers, but that's okay. Um, sea turtles can survive fairly well uh, or, or with uh, just their front, front flippers intact. And so here at, at LMC, we do release animals like this, um, provided everything else checks off medically. So that is Gumby, and he was an interesting case. And you can see kind of what happens with, um, you know, these, this, these trauma related to encounters with, with vessels. And, and, this, and this happens all over the world. Um, this is Topsy. So Topsy, the same kind of thing happened. And you see these wounds on her, on her carapace that are, that are consistent with propeller uh, encounters. And she also, it, it partially severed her spine. Um, and she also is, is paralyzed in the hind quarters. She went through a, a, a number of different um, uh, therapeutic uh, treatment protocols, which taught us a lot about this disorder. It taught us a lot about how there is not just a medical and a pathologic component that can be treated with 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 medical uh, with medicines and, and, and even surgery, uh, which I'll show you, but also there's a behavioral component that what happens is that when an animal with this syndrome is in the wild for for a long time and very often they're floating at the top or, or in that kind of realm for months, many, many months, they learn uh, an abnormal way of swimming and they adapt to that. And so when they're presented to the hospital, we have to correct that. And so th that's almost an entirely behavioral uh, uh, change that has to happen. It's retraining the muscle memory that is developed in a pathologic way. And, 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 and we have to return it to a normal function. Uh, and so it's, it really is an exercise in a form of physical therapy. And that's what we do. And, 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 and here we use um, dive weights to accomplish that in part. And those weights are refined on a very frequent basis, depending on how the animal um, adapts to uh, that weight and the change of it. The location of the weight is also very, very important for these caudally booing animals. Um, where that placement is, where you see this placement here with, with Topsy, um, is about where she, it needs to be. And this physics behind it is, are, is quite simple. And it's stuff that we learn in, in you know, grade school almost or high school um, is that just there's a lever arm and that lever arm requires a pivot. And so it's kind of like this, uh, here is the weight here on the syringe and here is the turtle's spine and it needs to be placed in the right location so that the animal can surface and can dive um, normally. And so this is what uh, Topsy is having done here. This is what, uh, a, a sea turtle should not surface alike. Uh, so uh, coming up to the surface like this is, a, is an abnormal thing. Um, these species will typically, in a normal, a normal behavior, will surface head first. And so this is just an example of what she was like in her hospital tank and what we were dealing with. So kind of this horizontal approach 
to the surface, which is, is not what we wanted. So that was a behavior we had to address. One of the things we thought about in, in buoyancy disorder, because we see it so often, was an animal that has a weight applied to its carapace obviously can't be released to the wild, back to the wild. So we thought, is there a better way? Is, is there something that could be done that can return these animals back to the wild? And so we thought about how implants work in, in humans and in other veterinary species. And we applied that same approach to an implant to correct buoyancy disorder on a permanent basis so that the animal can be released back to the wild. And in Topsy's case, she was the first one that we've attempted this with. Um, we designed um, a weight to be surgically implanted into her. And that is the weight right here. Um, the implantation site is in the pelvic girdle, very, very much sort of just right beneath where you saw those dive weights. And that site was chosen for a couple of reasons. One, the, it is important for the physics involved for the weight to be in a place where um, it would continue to grow with her as she grew, grew. meaning that as her spine got longer and she, she expanded from that perspective, the weight would stay in the same uh, location so that it could provide that pivot for that lever arm. And as she grew over time, um, we would want that to occur. So if I take this again here, this example, this syringe with a stopcock, if this is the weight inside her and she starts to grow like this, which is going to happen, this needs to be in this same location so that she can constantly adjust as she goes, as she gets bigger and bigger. And so that's what, one of the reasons why that location was chosen. The second reason really was you don't have a lot of places available to you um, and we, we don't want it to move. We want it to stay in the same surgical site when we want the body to react to it to the, to the, to the extent that scarring kind of forms around the implant and keeps it in place. And so we felt like this was, this was really the only location we could, we could attempt this. So this is her being prepped for surgery here. Um, and, and this is the actual uh, surgery and the, the implant going in into her pelvis there. As you can see, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty straightforward procedure. There's not a lot of blood involved. You know, there's not a lot of tissue and a lot, a lot of blood vessels in this region to begin with. Um, so that is, and this is her in, in the recovery uh, uh, box afterwards. And this is how we recover our turtles here after surgery. Um, they're, they're, uh, they can take some, some good period of time to, to wake up. Um, but we keep, we keep them in these box for everyone's safety, most, most notably for our patient. And then we, we, we monitor um, their, their respiration and other, other indices and also their heart rate with a portable ultrasound. So that's kind of how that works. So with, with, with every uh, um, kind of development of a novel uh, procedure, surgical procedure, and particularly with a, a surgical implant, you, you know going into it, you're going to have to refine it. And there's going to be more than one iteration of, of that procedure and of that device. So we've since refined that device from that single piece that was customized to the size of her pelvis to uh, a series of devices that are more generic so that we can um, add smaller amounts or larger amounts, depending on the patient, weight into that space. And also we can um, apply it and share it more widely. Most places are not going to have the ability to have a machinist create a customized weight for their patient. You need something you need to be able to work with quickly. And, and if you're going to do this around the world, which, which is what the hope is, um, it needs to be readily available and, and it needs to be um, cost effective too. And so all of those things kind of played into um, the, uh, the equation. But for, from a proof of concept point of view, um, this, this device performed really, really well and the procedure per went well and, and she uh, is doing well. And it turns out that she may not even need the implant after all. So it's to be, to be uh, continued, so to speak. But this is what 
she looked like right after the procedure. So this is what you want to see. She has an additional weight applied to her caudal carapace. You'll see there an, an additional external weight. That's to accelerate um, that sort of physical therapy approach, that retraining of the muscle memory approach postoperatively. But that's what you want um, to occur. You want them to be resting comfortably on the bottom. And she wasn't, she was floating on the top. So that's kind of the goal uh, with that um, with that procedure and that device and that approach. Um, who do I have next? Tafiti. Okay, another um, limb salvaging case here. So this uh, with a large animal. So this is an adult. Uh, uh, I believe this was a male, um, or, or right at the subadult level. I can't remember exactly, but Tafiti was a great patient and came in with a, a nearly circumfer fully circumferentially involved entanglement wound. Um, here. And so this is after a, a debridement, but, and after some healing, but this is kind of what we, we deal with, with these entanglements and, and trying to get these wounds back uh, up to scratch. Um, you know, one of the things with medical management, it's really a combination of medical and surgical management in cases like this. So we are doing serial debridements and the strategy with these types of debridements is that it's important to start early on in the process. Okay. Um, and get that tissue moving in a direction that you want it to move. So our, our surgical training as vets is, well, we can correct anything just about. We can do this, we can apply this, there's internal fixators or external, all kinds of really terrific, terrific approaches. But that doesn't work with these species. Their immune systems are different. How they approach healing is different. So the way I teach and tell students when they're dealing with sea turtles is you really act as like a surgical shepherd. You're not re reconstructing anything. What you're doing is you're pushing the tissue or you're pushing the healing process sort of gently in the direction that you think is going to uh, lead to the greatest chance of success for your patient and let the own animal's body do most of the work. And so that really is, is, a, is a feature that is, um, is, is a profound um, part of our practice is that we have to work within the limitations of what the animal gives us, not what we can do to fix something, but what the animal gives us. So she's a great example of that. Tafiti was a, this is the wound at the end here. So, you know, you get a pretty, just, this is right before release. And so I'm, I'm okay to release an animal with, with the fibronecrotic tissue, like at this stage, that's fine. Everything else checks out great. Um, so that's kind of what you get with this, this approach, with the aquapuncture, um, with debridements, with all of the integrative medicine. So that wound that down to the bone that was nearly 100% circumferentially involved is able to be salvaged. So that's what uh, the wound looked like at the end. And this is always great to see. This is right off our home beach here. And this is Tafiti going back home. And so um, she's, I think this is the clip. Yeah, so she was a little... <laughs> We're all laughing because she, she's going, see how you, she's going horizontally down the beach and not into the water. She, she had a, this propensity to kind of want to chase people. Um, she certainly chased, chased me. She didn't like me, I don't think. But um, so she saw a little boy down the beach and, I, and we think she's, that caught her eye and she had headed in that direction after him, I think. But then the water and the waves kind of distracted her and then she, she, went, back, she went back home. So she's back um, where she needs to be. Um, well, not all cases um, are success stories, okay? This is a, a large female leatherback um, that was struck uh, by a boat, a propeller rather, and that was um, really in very, very bad shape in our intercoastal waterway. So in kind of like a uh, harbored area of water where there's a lot of boat traffic. And so these, this, and we're all standing here, so you can see how shallow it is. And this, these are some concerned citizens who called this case in. And so I'm out, out there um, assisting with this. So what happens here? Obviously, an adult, you know, wild animal that weighs over a thousand pounds is not just going to let you do this to them um, without a fight. So she's in really, really debilitated uh, shape. Uh, these are the strikes to her head. Uh, they're not as severe. These are these are wounds that she could easily recover from. Um, but she was not able to, um, to be saved. And so we, had, we elected to euthanize uh, her. And this is her um, 
just after that and just kind of calling calling death. So you can see the wounds here. The, that's the wound that caused death there, that there on her front right. And um, you know, it's not a it's not a really dramatic looking wound, but it was sufficiently deep to involve major vessels in the shoulder area and, and she bled out. And so these giant animals are very, very difficult to treat in the field, um, if at all. And so it's always a challenge when, when we come across them to when they have a fresh wound that is potentially something where we can intervene, you know, uh, uh, some sort of uh, um, ligature or something that could have been applied or a surgical intervention here to close that vessel. Uh, in theory, it could be done, but everything would have to check off really, really perfectly for that to occur and it didn't in her case so it was very sad to have to do this and, and it comes with part of what we do in dealing with with wild animals so that was uh, just this last summer okay um i wanted to talk to you a little bit about kind of what are some of the things we're doing on the clinical research side and a lot of groups are doing some amazing things and we work with them and with some of these these um, topics that I'm going to just introduce really, really quickly. But to kind of give you an idea of what these what are the new frontiers in, in, in dealing with innovations with our patients. So uh, translational medicine, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of and everyone kind of is aware of who's in the field. That's taking things from different backgrounds, uh, from bench to bedside, so to speak. To, so the so that human medicine can't advance and evolve. We kind of re, are reversing that and we're taking what the most experimental human therapies are and transferring that to our patients, sea turtles. And so what, what I have listed here are some of the things that we're involved with that uh, are approaching uh, therapeutics from that kind of reverse translational model, okay? not from the bench to the human bedside, but from the human bedside to our tank, okay? So um, one of the things which uh, is, is exciting is, and this has been around, uh, in, you know, 100 years ago, but it's being revisited on a, on a molecular precision medicine basis now. And that's bacteriophage therapy. So just really briefly, a phage, a bacteriophage is a virus um, that can attack and kill a specific bacterium. And the advantage of that obviously is that you have very um, precise directed therapy against a pathogen if you know what that pathogen is. The disadvantage obviously is that it does not um, uh, impact a family of pathogens like, a, like, a, like antibiotics do. But what we found in some of our patients and, patients, and increasingly so is multi-drug resistant organisms. These and, and, and treatment failure when using uh, conventional antimicrobial approaches to the, to the point where there, there were no antibiotic um, options left. And so we, we began to explore the phage part of, of, of medicine and it's experimental on the human side, but our colleagues um, that we're working with were able to craft phages against two of the usual suspects that we see in our hospital that causes the problems. One is um, uh, Morganella morgani, and one is e the other is E. faecalis. So those two organisms, the, those two bacteria, um, are resistant in our populations, um, and increasingly so, to uh, conventional antibiotic therapy, and treatment fails as a result. So we were able to craft uh, a phage against those two organisms. And this here is what, what a phage, what the actual phage looks like under electron microscopy. And this is kind of a, just a simple graph of, of the cocktail of phage, phages here, the names of them are here. And what, what this means is that without any treatment, the bacteria kind of lives at a very high level. With the phage cocktail, it doesn't grow at all. So it basically is inhibited. And, it's been killed off. So uh, this is really a great um, potential approach to be able to use really mother nature's weapons against one of her, one of her own um, kind of organisms, which is, which is bacteria and, and multi-drug resistant bacteria. Um, one of the things that's important to, to remember when dealing with phages in general is, is on the human side, uh, there, there's very much of a, an effort to 
construct them, almost to genetically engineer them. It's not exactly that, but just for argument's sake, let me say that. Um, the, uh, the, we can't do that with endangered species. Okay, we can't introduce something that was genetically modified into into them. It's, it wouldn't be ethical and it wouldn't be legal, at least not in this country. So we had to look for other sources. So these phages exist in the ocean. Normally, they're they're out there, um, and so we just took seawater, got some of our colleagues involved who are very very bright and good at what they do, and they were able to identify and expand the uh, the um, the, the phage that we're using for our patients. And that is how we sourced these phages. So that's um, an important feature that I want, wanted to make clear here. Um, another thing we're doing, I kind of mentioned at the very beginning a little bit that I was involved in the organ transplant field on the human side. And there are actually, believe it or not, tremendous amounts of applications to sea turtle medicine with organ transplant technology, not for transplanting organs. But what we can do now is keep organs alive outside of the body for a very long time, um, you know, over a week, which is a long time uh, for in this context. And when that happens, the organ becomes your patient. And what you can do at this point is you can begin to modify the organ ex vivo you, be, you can test drugs on that organ. You can see how it behaves, how it performs in, in antimicrobial or phage therapy kind of context without involving the entire animal. Okay, so the source of an organ would be a recently deceased sea turtle. So you wouldn't go harvesting, or, you know, collecting organs from live animals, obviously. But uh, when animals are uh, terminally uh, um, struck by um, a boat, for example, those organs are available. And so we can use them to learn more about our species. And that's why this is a really exciting uh, avenue that we're exploring here too. Uh, our microbiome project, we just, we just uh, started a, a multi-year um, uh, funded project here to kind of describe the microbiome in these species uh, um, in, in wild populations and also in hospitalized populations. But we're using a different model. We're going, we're using, I'm um, not cloacal sources or fecal sources, but colonic sources. So uh, specimens that have been collected from the inside of the distal colon of these species. So we, we developed a technique here to be able to do that um, successfully without endoscopy. Um, so that's really exciting too. We're already seeing some pretty amazing um, results just from the, the about a dozen animals that we've evaluated already. So these are kind of the things that we're working on on the translational or the reverse translational or the precision medicine side. This project ultimately, you know, is we're involved with clinical medicine and clinical research. So we want this to hopefully uh, um, evolve into a therapeutic so that we can, you know, offer a pre or a sin or a probiotic to our patients um, that are being treated here so that their gut health is not disturbed too much, uh, if at all, when they're here with us. And I wanted to kind of finish with hatchlings because, of course, they're unbelievably cute. And um, this one, this kind of has, is a cool little story. So we get, uh, this is a, a leucistic um, hatchling. And we get uh, some of these occasionally here. I should point out um, uh, right off our beach, our research departments uh, manages and, 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 and patrols uh, about 10 miles of, of beach. And it's among the most densely nested beaches in the world for loggerheads in particular. And we get a, a lot of greens and leatherbacks as well and, and the occasional hawksbill. So about 15 to 20,000 nests are off our shore here. What that means is when you have that many nests, you have that many eggs and you have that many hatchlings, you will get um, anomalies like this. So we do get these uh, not, you know, every, every, every season we'll get one or two maybe or every other year or something like that. But we had this little guy and um, we decided to, uh, run some diagnostics that hadn't we hadn't done before on him. And so this is the normal green next to him. And so we took him to CT and to MRI to have a, have a look inside, because very often with these um, hypopigmented cases, whether it's albinistic or leucistic, 
they have internal abnormalities as well. And so we, we can evaluate them in a, in a really, really refined way with CT and MRI. And so this is the little guy in, inside the magnet. Um, and that's him right here. You can see him there. And this is um, the MRI of that little turtle. And he was probably about 35 grams. So this is the first time, certainly, th this is at a human hospital. We don't have an, a magnet, unfortunately, here. But this is the first time that was ever done by them um, and in a tissue, a living tissue that was that small. So it was a learning experience for them as well. Um, this was the CT, which is much more rewarding. But we were looking to see what was going on in him. And if you look closely up here, these are pieces of plastic. OK, so this this is a 3D reconstruction of this little guy. And, and the plastic is is in all of our post hatchlings, 100% um, actually of uh, hatchlings that uh, we see here, post hatchlings um, that that don't make it on necropsy. 100% of them have plastics in their GI tract, so that's a subject for a different talk, but it's an important one. And those are little pieces of plastic that we can appreciate there. This turtle ended up passing them, no problem. And this was uh, him right before his release. So you could see some pigment came in nicely on his carapace, and uh, but the soft tissue um, retained that hypopigmentation, but a very, very handsome fellow there. So we're happy to release him as well. Um, and that is it for my talk today. Um, I've got a couple of images on here of um, kind of really cool cases that I was involved with this this last year. On your right, uh, with the leatherback mom here, this is uh, an entanglement um, as she was nesting in the daytime, just right off our beach here, and uh, uh, braided uh, fishing line wrapped around both of her front flippers and around her neck and into her, into her oral cavity. And so what I'm doing here is attempting to look into her mouth to perform um, a non-invasive uh, oral exam, and she uh, she allowed me to do it uh, as she was taking her breaths, and uh, so it was a really amazing experience. And this here is Olmec. Olmec, we was in our care for a couple of days. This is the oldest and largest uh, loggerhead we've ever treated here in over thirty years, and uh, he didn't make it. Um, but this gives you an idea of how massive his head was and, and just what, how majestic. He looked as a really ancient animal, likely over 100 years, maybe well over that. Um, and the necropsy uh, revealed that he died. The likely cause of death was a number of things, but um, he had severe endocarditis, uh, which is an inflammation of, of tissues in the heart and the, and the vessels of the heart, and in his, his case, the valves of the heart. Um, and uh, a novel organism was actually found that, um, that potentially contributed to that, that infection. Um, but notably, his, his joints looked really, really good for a guy that was over 100 years old. You know, he gets a lot of exercise, obviously, but his joints looked terrific. So we, we didn't see any evidence of degenerative joint disease for the vets out there, which I thought was really cool. But that, um, is, uh, the, that is the end of my talk, and I want to thank you again uh, for your time, and I hope you found this um, informative, and um, and I really you know, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share what we do here at Loggerhead Marine Life Center, and our and on behalf of our entire team. It takes an enormous team here to do this, like it does in all of your in all of your facilities. Um, I want to thank you, and 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 also uh, uh, make sure that um, um, you can see how important bringing people together in this very, very small field uh, it, uh, it is of value. Because if we can increase our, our approach and our standard of care in treating our patients um, at any level, they have a better chance at success in the wild. And I think all of us want that for them. And all of us are drawn to these species um, because it's an honor to treat them and to care for them and to study them. And so the Sea Turtle Rescue Alliance, um, I think, in my estimation, is a great launching uh, pad to, to that goal. And so I, I welcome all of you who are considering join, joining and those of you that have joined already, thank you. And uh, there's only good things to come in the future. So let us, um, if I have any questions or anything. Um, Hi, Max. Thank hey. you so much. That was an incredible first 
talk for the series. I'm really, really amazed by the work that you do there. And we do have some questions, of course, because it was obviously a brilliant talk. So um, I'll start off with the first one was from Matthew um, from Reunion. And he said, on which parameters do you decide a turtle is okay or not to be returned to the wild? Um, and actually we had another question very similar to that. So do you have a process to prepare the turtle before release? That's from Watcher. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, hi, Matthew. Um, what we do here is um, we're very lucky to be able to collect at least weekly uh, full blood uh, blood panel, blood work, and 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 our in-house CBC evaluation, and 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 so the the general criteria are that they must be healthy, as determined by the absence of systemic treatment for at least two weeks. And if the animal, so if the wound is healed, all of that's okay. And based on CBC and, and chemistries, if the animal is clinically normal and is not on particularly antibiotics uh, for at least two weeks, then we, we release that, that, that patient. And that's really it. Um, there are sometimes other things involved, but from a general perspective, that's how we, that's how we uh, uh, make those decisions. And the watcher has sort of, sort of followed that up with, and do you do anything at all to prepare them for release? So, um, not not a, a preparing it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think just sort of ticking the boxes, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what, uh, yeah, of course, we check off all the blood chemistries mm -hmm. and 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 our CBC. That's a very very important thing. We have to obviously uh, approve things with our regulatory authorities here. And that uh, involves the location of the animal. But in terms of the clinical status and things like that, when an animal, let's say, has been here for some time, we want to introduce them and continue to, to offer uh, things like enrichment devices while they're here and try to craft those devices to mimic both um, and encourage feeding behavior that we want to see, mm -hmm. as well as structure that they would um, likely uh, find in the wild, like uh, artificial reef type um, structure that we build for them. So we want them to kind of get uh, back into usage and familiarity with things in, in, their, in, their, in their environment. And so that's really kind of the only thing we would do there is uh, in addition to the medical clearance and the, the absence of systemic treatment. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. We have one from uh, Dr. Minnie Little from the Oliver Bidley Project. And um, she says, uh, loving the talk, thank you, Max. And for Cecil's case, it's fascinating because as you know, we also see severe soft tissue wounds and circumferential ligature damage, exposed bones, et cetera. Do you find that osteomyelitis is an issue in these cases? Um, I see radiographic evidence of osteomyelitis very regularly and it can be challenging to get on top of. Did the exposed bone slough at all? And in my experience, any exposed periosteum has sloughed off. So I was intrigued as to which parts it managed to keep. <sighs> That's a Was this Minnie? <laughs> yeah, that's Minnie. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Minnie. Um, those are great questions. Um, so I'll take the um, the osteomyelitis, which we which we see not just in open wounds, but we also see see them in, in animals that are debilitated with without an open wound. Um, and we treat we we typically don't tap a joint, um, and we typically don't get invasive uh, with the joint, provided that the radiographic evidence is that the infection is limited to a single joint or at least a single limb. Um, and we can treat it, we can treat the animal systemically in a, in a safe fashion. Um, getting on top of it takes, takes time. And bone disease, as you know, takes a long time to heal. So they're, they're mm -hmm. often on, tr uh, on treatment for, for a considerable time. So that brings up other things that have to be managed, like the GI tract that I talked about, like how, you know, what disturbance are you imparting when you're treating um, one part of, of a pathology um, and need to consider what you're doing to the other part of the, the your patient. So all of the things are considered um, in, in, that, in that case. Um, in terms of, uh, and that's bacterial. So if we see a fungal infection, that mediates uh, this disease process. That's a different thing, and that's that prognosis is 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 poor, sometimes mm -hmm. grave, and and we also approach that with systemic treatment using different meds, obviously. But but that is a, is a different problem altogether. 
Osteomyelitis, you know, we find that um, you can treat it and it's there. And, the, and again, the sea turtle's body can, can do a lot. And it, it, it tends to uh, clear it or at least kind of wall it off and, 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 and still maintain function in that limb. So we, we, we don't get really too, too crazy about it, but we see it. We see it. I know you see it a lot in, with your patients um, in, mm. in, in the location that you're, you're in, but that's kind of our yeah. approach. It's, 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 much, it's not so, uh, you know, what you would typically do as in your, in your veterinary training, you know, get to, the, get to the organism by all costs and culture and sensitivity and treat that specifically. That's a great approach. But when we, with these species, we found that getting into joints and so forth is very unrewarding and can, can lead to, to pathologic sequelae down the, down the way. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, Penelope is sort of following on from Cecil's treatment. How long was Cecil receiving treatment for? Cecil was for from the very beginning pictures you saw to his release. Um, that was about a th that was about a four five month period. So it's a wow. long it's a long time. Yeah, it's a long time. You know, I considered we have available to us uh, xenografts too, and I considered that in his case. The xenograft tissue um, in in this in the, what we would use is a is a processed cod skin graft, and but there wasn't enough uh, tissue to be able to sew that onto um, mm -hmm. around his wound. He just wasn't available, so he would have had like a nice piece of expensive sushi floating around in his tank if, if I put it on, you know, by the next day. An extra actually. treat, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> So we just kept it. We just kept it the way the way I described it. But um, that would be the only other thing I would consider. Um, but about five months, yeah. Amazing, thank you. And then we've got a question from the Sea Turtle Hospital at University of Florida Whitney Lab. Do you have a CT on site? If so, do you CT all of your post hatchlings? Hey, Whitney Lab. Um, <laughs> no, we don't have one on site. Our CT. So the advanced diagnostics we have. We go about 10 minutes down the road to Jupiter Medical Center, great partners of ours, which is the human hospital here. Um, and so we take, we don't, we don't uh, CT any of our post hatchlings at all. We CT the leucistic one and his kind of clutch mate, so to speak, uh, a normal one, just to see if there were abnormalities in the leucistic and what a normal turtle looked like in the case of, of, the, of the normal little grain. But we, that's not something, I wanted to share that to kind of show you something cool, but we don't do that for post hatchlings. We take patients to CT, A, provided they can fit in the gantry. So that's, that's the rate limiting step there. But B, is it clinically indicated? So we go very frequently, um, probably on an average, almost once every two weeks or so, and we'll bring patients there. Um, but that's how we do it. Yeah, that's how we do it. And I guess a follow up to the leucistic is a question from Grace. Um, were you worried about releasing the leucistic turtle back into the wild just because of his color? Yeah, we got that a lot from, from many people. And, and mm -hmm. you know, you're concerned. You think, okay, it's like a beacon for a predator. However, having said that, uh, overseas, I've seen adult, subadult and juvenile leucistic sea turtles in the wild. So there are some that can make it. And I've seen that with my own eyes and colleagues of mine who are in Asia is where I've seen them in those waters. They confirm that too. So um, yeah, we, we, you know, we are concerned, but we're, going to we're not going to consider keeping them or anything like that. So we're going to return them back and let nature take its course. But obviously uh, we're seeing them um, emerging from nests and, and albinistic ones as well. So someone is, passing these genes down uh, that, that, that are at that stage. So, yeah, but we, we release them. Of course, you, it's, in, it's in your mind, but we, we're not gonna do anything heroic or certainly not gonna keep them long-term. Yeah, thank you. And then message from Anya, do you have any message, uh, means to follow up on your patients to make sure they survive for a longer period of time in the wild? Yeah, we do, we do. Um, that's a great question. Um, our research department here, uh, they are great at applying satellite tags to selected patients of ours. They do it for turtles that are in the field, um, nesting moms specifically, but our patients get uh, satellite tags as well upon release. And so not all of them because it's an expensive device, unfortunately. I'd love to satellite tag all of them, but we just can't afford that. But yeah, we do monitor them. And on our website, some of the patients that have been 
um, released with satellite tags, you can kind of see where they've gone. At the very beginning of my presentation, there was a picture of a hawksbill, a female hawksbill adult. Her name is Heidi. She was just released about 10 days ago. And so she's made it, she went up north along the coast of Florida, and then she took a big turn and now she's headed south down into the Caribbean, we think. Uh, so we do get to monitor them on, on selected occasions. And, and it's, it's a great trough of, of data and information. It's not just the location, it's the, the duration of the dive, it's the depth of the dive, it's the trajectory of the dive, is it straight down, is it more rounded? All of those things uh, we're able to collect when they surface to breathe and that signal goes up to the satellite. So um, yeah, we do, we do track them. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that also answered Alexander's question too, which is similar to the satellite tags. Um, and so this is a bit of a big one, but I guess maybe just sort of um, just explain uh, what medications do you use or prefer to immobilize the turtle for treatments, including reversal agents? That's from Kristen. Maybe an overview. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So if, uh, I'm assuming that's coming from a veterinarian. So as anesthesia and analgesia is pro are probably the two most artistic forms of, of yeah. <laughs> veteran, veteran medicine. So every 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 clinician has their own cocktail or or whatever, their own kind of way of approaching it. So the way I approach it here is that it obviously depends on the life stage of the animal, the severity, the morbidity, um, and what you're trying to accomplish procedural wise and so forth. So a lot of things happen in in that equation. Um, and, and what I what we also know is that although they share many of the receptors um, that are known to be involved with the with anesthesia and particularly with analgesia in in mammals, they also have different ones that we don't know what they're there for, and the densities and the and the location of receptors that are similar. Um, in, 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 in what they are, they differ in location and number in these patients. So we, we're not really sure the overall picture of what happens. So it's hard to really give you just a single answer. I can give you kind of a, a anecdotal story about like, for example, Tafiti, who you saw with that huge the circumferential trauma to his flipper. I, I used dexmedetomidine and fentanyl initially for the debridements. And that did nothing at all. I mean, the, the animal was not, did not get sedate and did not appear to be um, relieved of any discomfort in the, from the procedure. But what did work was local anesthetic. It worked tremendously well. It worked not just during the procedure, it worked post-operatively. And we watched them obviously very closely post-operatively, but they have very, very kind of classical behavioral changes after a surgery. Um, and they, they seem to all kind of follow those, those behavioral changes over time to the point where they're feeling okay. And the, just the local anesthetic with lidocaine um, proved to be the best in that case. And you kind of wouldn't, you would have thought, well, I'd use that in, in, in addition to these other drugs, fentanyl, which is a powerful opioid, as you know, and then dexmedetomidine. But it turned it turned out in that case, and now going forward, I really go more toward just just local anesthetics and really target what I'm trying to do with that tissue, um, and not get involved with with a full you know systemic kind of like I'm going to to surgery and, and requiring general anesthesia. Um, but to your point of immobilizing an animal long enough to maybe it is your point, but I'll just address it really quickly uh, for intubation or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, Ketamine, uh, I, I like, and uh, for a variety of reasons. And sometimes you, I top it off with uh, dexmedetomidine as well. Um, and that gives me great access for a short period of time. The reversal agents I, I want to speak to, though, um, because that's um, used, I think, ubiquitously. So when you, when you have dexmedetomidine or metatomidine or something like that, and you reverse that, you have to be very careful, and I don't know what your instrumentation cap capacity is like, but there is a refractive period in the reversal that can be very, very dangerous, and you can lose an animal, and, and I've seen that, where w on the administration of the reversal, not only is the animal becoming bradycardic, they're becoming severely bradycardic, 
and there's hypoperfusion going on, and which leads to, as you can imagine, damage later down the line. So I would use those agents with caution or at least with a lot of experience. Um, and there's also related to that species specific differences. So greens metabolize drugs differently. And we know this and now it's, it's being published a lot actually than loggerheads do, than also chems do. And, and, and certainly hawksbills, uh, hawksbills like just Heidi that, that we, uh, she had a partial amputation that she needed because she was, the reason she presented she was attacked by a shark. She's metabolized sedatives and, uh, and analgesic med medications way differently than the loggerhead does. So all of those kind of things as a, as a clinician, you got to kind of balance. But I'd be happy if you want to contact me directly afterwards, I'd be happy to share some things. And the Alliance website, as we're moving forward here with our, with our continued launch this year, are going to have terrific resources that will speak directly to those types of protocols. We've got so many questions, Max, but I think we'll cover two more and then I'll say to all the other questions, this is wonderful. And actually some of them uh, are giving us really good ideas. Oh, Wait, you broke can you, up there. Can you hear me now? Okay. okay. So we have, hello. <laughs> we have so many questions that I think some of them are going to be wonderful questions to actually do further future talks on, in fact. So please do continue to ask questions and anything that we obviously think will be a really good talk to be covered in the future, we will do. But just a couple more for Max before we um, let him go and rest I'm sorry, Claire, you're um, breaking up. Oh no, can you? Okay, can I can you hear you now. All? Yeah, all right, let's try one more. Um, in terms of oxygen hyperbaric treatments for recovering positively buoyant turtles, what kind of treatment slash tables treatments Okay, I didn't hear the rest of that. I, I, I just heard hyperbaric oxygen. Okay. Yeah, let's go, go with that. <laughs> Go. Okay, so hyperbaria. So we're getting, um, we, right now we use a specialist clinic right down the road, but we are in our expansion, we have a custom made chamber that we're, we're going to have here. And I'm a big, big believer in hyperbaria for a variety of reasons. Uh, for wound therapy, it is, it is outstanding. Um, obviously for decompression sickness, which, which these animals do get, I mean, if they get tangled up in a, in a net or some kind of structure underneath the water, and they can't get to the surface or they get and they get, and they're pulled up too quickly the same pathology occurs in them as does with with human scuba divers for example um so that's available as well we've had a number of patients that had decompensated from a respiratory point of view that we rushed to the chamber and that likely saved their lives so it's a really really uh great um, modality to have if you have it available to you. And a lot of the places that um, maybe maybe joining us today are in you know beautiful islands where there's a lot of diving going on. And they most most typically would have a, a decompression chamber there. If it's available to you, I would encourage you know for selected cases to, to attempt it. Um, in terms of the atmospheres and taking the animal in the dive in the chamber, I mean, and then out of the dive. So I don't exceed 2.2 atmospheres of oxygen or a pressure rather in, in pure oxygen and don't exceed about 40 minutes of actual treatment time. It takes about 15 minutes to get into that dive and 30 to 45 minutes in, in the dive and then about 15 minutes to come out of it. Okay. So that's the general concept, but don't exceed two to, I mean, I don't exceed two atmospheres. Let's just say that. Okay. And how many sessions max normally? Well, that's a great question. So it depends on what the presenting condition is. How many sessions was the question? Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, if you have a, an, emerg an emergency, like uh, these pulmonary cases I was talking about, you know, you treat until you get a clinical response. And um, that can be two, two times a day, even three times a day. In other species, that's done regularly, several times a day. Um, so I would say maybe two times a day for a few days and see what happens. It could, be just, it could even just be one or two days. The most recent patients that I've taken to the chamber with um, they only needed maybe two days maximum of a single a single session on each day, and then, and that does it. Um, you know, you want to confirm things if you can with blood gases and things like that, and be sure to to correct your your measurements of that with uh, what's available in in the literature. There are two equations that are required to correct the important indices of a blood gas uh, before you're evaluating that clinically, and then other patients may take about a week. And I haven't had I haven't had to do it longer than that. That but that doesn't mean that you can't. So that's in a nutshell what we do in terms of frequency. 
Wonderful, thank you. And just to final, one final question, if that's okay, Max. I heard wonderful, um, thank you, you, and that was it. <laughs> okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Can you quickly just describe what do you feel about blood transfusions in tur sea turtles? Yeah, we, so that's a great question too. That's something that we do and other groups do as well. And we're working on um, identifying the blood types of sea turtles because no one knows what those are. But you can successfully cross match a, a, a turtle without knowing its blood type. So in order to do that, um, you need to have somebody experienced in reading the slide um, in the process of if conducting the major and minor cross matches, in particularly the major cross match. As a general concept, I would not uh, cross species. So if you're going to match a donor to a recipient, match a green to a green, a logger to a logger, et cetera. That's the first principle. The second principle that I use personally is that on the slide, if there's a single agglutination, if I see two red blood cells stuck together, to me, that's a positive cross match, and I'm not going to use that donor. Not everyone thinks like that, however. So again, this is more of like just your own clinical intuition and experience. We're just publishing a paper about a point of care cross-matching kit that has been uh, modified from small animal practice to be used in sea turtles. So you don't need to worry about all the microscopes and having experienced people. And, and, and the cross-match process takes time uh, it can take, you know, a couple of hours in some cases, and you may not have that available to you in a critical case situation. Um, but this point of care thing eliminates all of that. Um, so that's another option that would be available in a not too distant future. But cross matching, um, uh, that's the sort of concept behind it, the way we approach it here. And we do, and we do, do it. Um, whether there's a transfusion reaction, it's very, it's very hard to gauge that as well. And if you suspect ever that that may be happening, you know, obviously um, steroid uh, therapy right away can buy you some time in that regard. Um, and that's kind of our approach. Wonderful. Thank you, Max. Um, I think I'll leave it there and we will, um, if there are any more Sorry, questions. Sorry, you broke up again. Is it okay if you stop screen, sharing your screen there, Max? And I'll yeah, take over. Think. Thank you. Well done. That was a brilliant, incredible talk. Thank you so much again. Um, right. I'm You're just welcome. going to, finish off quickly um just by saying what can you do now i, I hope can. you enjoyed the, i hope you enjoyed the first of our talks with dr max um please will you go onto our website if you would like to know more about the sea turtle rescue alliance we've recently just posted the newsletter in may and so you can find out more about what we're hoping to achieve what we've achieved so far and uh, what the next steps are for the members that have already applied um, and if you do want to become a member the information is on our website uh, it's on become a member and there are forms to fill out either as an individual or if your centre can be an affiliated partner with the Rescue Alliance, the forms are to be found there. Um, and I'd like to just take this opportunity to really thank Ocean Care again for their incredible uh, funding and support to actually make Ocean uh, make the Strah uh, possible and the Strah's steering committee to date and the Lamarve team for help to facilitate this meeting and also to all the rescue centres that have been in touch with us so far. It's really been, um, wouldn't have been possible without you and your guidance and what you'd like to know from us as well. So um, I really just want to say a huge thank you again. There we are. Um, please do get in touch with us. The email's just there. Become a member if you'd like to um, and join us and help to create this platform ready for everyone to enjoy. And obviously the questions were wonderful. So we're hoping to set some more, um, some more talks soon for the future. So watch us basically watch the space watch our social media we'll update you shortly and um yeah wonderful first talk so thank you again dr max um and yeah can't can't thank you enough really it was absolutely brilliant so i'll see you soon bye